So during an interview with Newsroom Africa presenter Stephen Hrotis on Friday, former Gauteng Premier Mbazi Mashilowa said the finance minister is looking into a family income grant instead of an income grant for the individual. Shilowa's remarks come after the government propose, after government's proposal rather of a family grant to replace the COVID social relief of distress grant. There's no debate that is going to be implemented and it may have um, something to do with the uh, outcome of the local elections, but it will also have to do with the pressure that is there. But I think even though it's implemented, I'm not sure it's going to be about the basic income grant because even now there are rumblings that uh, Enoch Gorongwana is speaking less about the basic income grant, but more about a family grant, in other words, rather than per individual, it will be per household, which would be a very difficult issue. But I've got no doubt, uh, you know, Stephen, that all political parties, when they are in trouble, they throw money at the trouble. So the ANC won't be the first, and it's not going to be the last. Let's get into more details on this. I'm joined by Josh Butlinda, research affiliate at the South African Labor Development Research Unit that's at the University of Cape Town. Mr. Butlinda, good afternoon to you and thank you very much for joining us. Firstly, your reflection on this debate. Afternoon, thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, I, was, I was part of a team which was commissioned by National Treasury to look at a whole lot of these different grant options. Um, and, you know, as we just heard in that little excerpt, that's kind of the two options people have been talking about a lot recently are a basic income grant or um, instituting what people call a family income grant or family poverty grant. Uh, there are a couple of other options which are also under consideration, though, such as, for example, bringing back the current 350 rand so social relief of distress grant um, or even topping up the child support grant or trying to do some kind of public works program instead. Our report uh, looked at these options, which Treasury had asked us uh, to look at. And I'm, I'm speaking here individually, not on behalf of the authors of the report. But I think that um, the kind of broad conclusions we came to were that the three options which looked kind of most appealing were either, um, or that seem that they may accomplish people's objectives the best, were this family poverty grant or a social distress grant, SRD extension, or potentially a basic income grant. Um, but there are strengths and weaknesses to all these approaches. So, I mean, you know, the, the kind of, the, 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 in the media at least, the story that, about why Treasury may be favoring the family poverty grant is that in theory it could be very very efficient to target poverty meaning that relatively little money uh, can have a very big poverty impact um, but there are a lot of concerns that have been raised recently about whether the family poverty grant can actually be implemented as it's designed um, which is something i can talk to please if you would like that uh, yeah so i mean basically the idea of the family poverty grant which makes it very efficient uh, in theory is that you look at households and you get their whole household income um, and so government would go to every household and they would say you know, who are your household members, uh, how many people are there in this household, and what's the income of each person. And using that method, in theory, government can then identify very clearly which are the poorest households uh, in, the, in the country, and they can say, if you're below the certain poverty line, we're now going to uh, give you a, a grant, I think it was around uh, 440 rand per adult uh, per month. The, and that, in theory, is a very efficient way to target poverty because you are going directly to the poorest households. The problem is that it would be extremely difficult to implement this, this approach um, because, you know, how does government know who's in what household? Uh, like right now, government doesn't have a registry identifying individuals and linking them to households. And it's worth asking how government would ever be able to implement that. As we know, in South Africa, we have a kind of very diverse household structures because of the migrant labor system or extended families. Households constantly form and, re and, and dissolve and household members get added and kind of leave households. So it's very hard to think how government would credibly do that. But the other concern that people have is that if you're kind of distributing a grant through the household, uh, that that might have sociological implications because, you know, what will happen? Who gets the grant in the household? Is mm -hmm. it going to be a patriarch or a matriarch in the household? Are they going to fairly distribute that grant to other people in the household? What if somebody wants to leave a household? You know, we have we obviously have very high rates of gender-based violence in South Africa. But if somebody wants to leave a household, does that mean they just suddenly won't get the grant anymore because the grant is attached to the household rather than to the individual? So this household grant would be a very dramatically new way of doing grants in South Africa. Normally, currently, all our grants are administered to individuals. And this household method, in theory, could be more efficient, but it really seems like um, that it's, it's, it, 
be very big worries about how it could be implemented and that there might be kind of unintended consequences. Um, so, yeah. Um, and the other options, kind of the social distress grant extension or basic income grant, um, the, the benefits of those methods is that they would be easier to implement, but they wouldn't be as efficient in targeting poverty. In particular, the basic income grant is relatively inefficient when it comes to targeting poverty because it goes to a lot of different people who are not actually poor, but it would be easy to implement because you wouldn't be so worried about targeting and getting the right people. Uh, kind of the conclusion of the report, I think, is that extending the social relief and distress grant is kind of a middle ground. It's not as efficient as the family poverty grant in theory, but it's more implementable than the basic income grant. So, so nuanced, right? I'd like for us to take a look at the cost of all this in a moment, but let me come back to the family poverty uh, grant. You mentioned strengths and weaknesses with all three models. Uh, so you've mentioned the weaknesses of it. So what are the strengths, if any? Yeah, so the, the big strength is that if the family poverty grant could be um, implemented effectively, then it, it, it entails a really dramatic poverty reduction for like not that, I mean, I mean, of course, it's quite a lot of money, but much cheaper than other options. So, for example, in our modeling, the family poverty grant cost around 60 billion rand a year to implement, but it reduced poverty more than, for example, the social relief and distress grant at 70 billion, or even more the kind of targeted basic income grant, which uh, would have cost 200 billion. So, because it's such an, if you can actually implement it, then you can really give money to the poorest households and not worry about giving money to any richer households. So, that's really what the, the, the benefit of it would be. The big question is, can it actually be implemented? And we kind of have this additional work, which should be coming out myself and a, a co-author, showing that if the, if the implementation isn't perfect, that the family poverty grants kind of efficiency in reducing poverty actually drops quite rapidly. So it's not only difficult to implement, but if it's not implemented properly, we, we, we think that there, it, it's, it loses its advantage quite quickly. The devil is in the detail, if you will, and the detail here is very complex. Some people even struggling with voter registration, having no formal addresses, and here we are having this ambitious plan of the family poverty grant. One wonders, you know, where those people will be gotten from so that they can also benefit. In terms of cost, can we afford this? I ask you this specifically in relation to when we compare apples with apples with what other countries on the continent are doing. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, you know, ultimately, I think to some extent it comes down to your priorities. Um, you know, 60 billion rand per year or 70 billion rand for the social relief and distress grant extension, which is kind of an upper bound on what the SRD could cost, is certainly not something we just can't afford. Um, it would mean sacrifices in other areas of, of the budget for sure, or perhaps potentially raising taxes, which some people think is fine and some people think isn't fine. The, I, Personally, um, you know, the arguments, I, I understand arguments in favor of a basic income grant. Um, there are a lot of people in this country who just have no access to any kind of income through no fault of their own. Uh, but the basic income grants at either 200 billion or 250 billion a year, that is certainly a very substantial expenditure which needs to be understood as something which is, you know, not to be taken lightly. Those kind of expenditures are more than if we combine the current expenditure on the child support grant and the old age pension combined is not as much as, you know, 250 billion. So those are very substantial. Um, my co-author on the report, uh, Maya Goldman, will be writing a public piece very shortly outlining what are some of the venues by which one could raise money for these grants. And those are things like, if you didn't want to take on debt, you can do it through VAT increases and personal income tax increases. Um, but those are serious trade-offs which need to be considered, especially because it's an expenditure which is durable. You can't institute a basic income grant or any of these grants and then just not do it next year. Once you've got it, it's, it's, it's here to stay. So it's a substantial expenditure to think about over time. But mm -hmm. personally, I think that is something we really, whichever way we do it, the social grant system does need to be expanded in some way to incorporate people who are not, right now it only really supports children, people with disabilities, elderly people. And that's this idea that these dependent categories supposedly who can't get work on the labor market or the state should support them. But the reality in South Africa is that there are millions and millions of people, working age people, able-bodied able -bodied people, who can't get jobs, not because it's their own fault, but just that there aren't enough jobs in the country. And I think they do need some state support. Just on the back of that, right, um, all these people that you think need state support, I'm curious as to the temperature of conversations throughout the research, throughout the engagements. Did you have, you know, differing opinions in terms of whether we should actually have a grant system in the country at all? 
No, so I mean, when it comes to when it comes to the question of whether social ground should exist in South Africa, there is no debate whatsoever amongst kind of uh, serious econ economists. It is just you know the, the what social grants do to reduce poverty in this country is just incredible compared. To, I mean, obviously we have a lot of poverty in this country already, but you know, for the bottom say 30 or 40 percent of the population in terms of their income rankings, social grants can con contribute up and more than half the total household income. These are people who would really struggle to get to get uh, jobs uh, and get labor market income. Again, as I stressed, you know, through no fault of their own. We have a particular history in this country where people have been kind of treated as surplus and just discarded into rural areas or former, former homelands, and the economic system did not absorb them or serve them. And that's a legacy we have to deal with, and those people deserve at least some support uh, so that they're not just kind of discarded once again. What have you found um, where monies have been redirected and they don't necessarily benefit the people that they're supposed to that this money is supposed to to, to benefit right so one of the benefits of the social grants is that there is generally uh, fairly little leakage or corruption in terms of money getting directly to poor people this is something that people you know the money is loaded on their sasa card and they have access to it that stands in like stark contrast to something like food parcels where there's clearly a lot of corruption um, and a lot of misappropriation of funds by kind of vendors uh, who are, are buying food parcels and then distributing them. A lot of money gets lost that way. So I think social grants in general are one of the most efficient ways uh, to distribute money directly to poor people uh, and are one of the ways which there's relatively little corruption. Of course, there have been problems in the past. I mean, you may remember um, there, there have been court cases about garnishee orders where kind of companies would uh, subtract money from people's social grants before they had actually uh, even received them. There's been concerns about the uses of people's private biometric information. Uh, there was this whole controversy which cash came out the systems a, a couple of years ago. So the, no system is perfect, but at least my view is that relative to the other kinds of systems of social support we have in South Africa or anti-poverty kind of policies, the social grants are very direct and very, very efficient. Throughout this conversation, we are sharing um, data compiled by Statista, um, and we're looking at, you know, a breakdown per province. So you've got KwaZulu-Natal with the most recipients and the Northern Cape with the least, which I, quite, I found quite uh, fascinating. In the work that you do, which provinces account for the most number of people that get mm -hmm. grants? So the specific work on this um, that we've been doing on modeling uh, the kind of basic income grant, the social distress grant, we haven't really looked very much at a provincial breakdown. But I, you know, one can tell that what you've said makes a lot of sense, and it will be the same for these grants. On the one hand, there's just the, the very basic issue of population. Obviously, you know, the Northern Cape has very low population, KwaZulu Natal, Eastern Cape, etc., have high populations. But the other part of the story is that if you map the, the social grants go to poor people, right? And if you map poverty in South Africa and you see where it is, it very, very closely follows the old homeland boundaries, which kind of speaks to what I was saying earlier about this being a legacy issue and something that we have to relate to our, our past. And so you will see a lot of social grants in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, in the Eastern Cape, in the Northern, what used to be the Northern Transvaal, areas that used to have, uh, you know, high homeland, uh, high numbers of people who had been forced to live in former homelands. Uh, and so, it's no surprise that most of the social grant money goes to those areas and those provinces because that's where poor people live. I'm sure we'll ventilate this issue a little bit further throughout the coming days and weeks and months. Uh, it is something that is with us and quite important. So thank you for the work you do and thank you for sharing it with us. Josh Butlender, research affiliate at the South African Labor Development Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. Do